we are down to our last part of the program, but one that's pretty important, and it's now our closing keynote. Um, as you have all heard, but I think it's important that I reiterate this, we are extremely grateful to the support that the MSEC has received through the National Science Foundation. That support has been instrumental in getting us to where we are at this point in time and to continue to support all the potential and vision of the MSEC. So um, again, I, I wanna say we are very thankful to the National Science Foundation for putting their trust and belief and commitment with the MSEC. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to a person from the National Science Foundation that has been our champion too. Uh, and from the very beginning, also has tracked and seen and supported the MSCC. Dr. Manish Parashar is the Office Director of the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure at the National Science Foundation, where he oversees investments in national cyber infrastructure. He also serves as the co-chair of the National Science and Technology Council's Subcommittee on the Future Advanced Computing Ecosystem and the National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource Task Force. Manish is on assignment to the National Science Foundation from the University of Utah, where he's the director of the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute, the chair in computational science and engineering, and a presidential professor in the Collard School of Computing. Manish is also a fellow of um, AAAS, uh, ACM, and IEEE. Did I say it correct? AAAS, okay. Great, three A's. Thank you. So uh, Manish, uh, welcome, and so glad you could join us. Thank you, Anna, for the great introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm, well, first, it's a great opportunity for me to be able to talk to you. And I'm so sorry to miss what I can see is such a great event. Um, I'd, I'd like to, before I get started, just give a shout out to Kevin, who should have been speaking to you today. Um, he's, you know, so I've been uh, on, uh, you know, on the cheering squad for MSCC, but he's the person who's really uh, the person behind it. It's his passion and dedication that has made this a reality, right? So big shout out to Kevin here. Uh, he he unfortunately couldn't make it, and and I'm I'm happy to give his talk this talk on his behalf. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about OEC, the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, and the, some of the things we have been doing. But then I want to focus in on two efforts uh, that I think are very relevant to this group. And, and really, I'm hoping that I could get uh, your inputs and feedback either now or down the line on, on some of the issues that I'll be talking about around these efforts. So uh, let me get started. Before I go, I wanted to introduce you to the Office of Cyber Infrastructure. Uh, this is an office that's housed within uh, the Directorate of Computer Science, uh, uh, Com Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Uh, and uh, so this is one of the subunits within the size directorate. Uh, uh, it's an office rather than a division. Normal subunits are called divisions, but it's an office because its mandate spans the entire foundation. And these are the people uh, who really make it all happen. Right, this is an amazing dedicated group of people. And as, as far as I'm concerned, they walk on water. They really are so dedicated to doing the right thing for the community. Um, and uh, if you get a chance, I do encourage you to reach out and, and talk to them. So let me start by talking a little bit about the overarching mission of the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, which uh, this uh, to really it's about transforming science through our investment in cyber infrastructure, right? Uh, so the vision of the Office of Cyber Infrastructure is to really create a national uh, cyber infrastructure ecosystem that can enable science and engineering in the 21st century. We envision this as an equitable, agile, 
integrated, robust, trustworthy, and sustainable cyber infrastructure that can drive new thinking and transformative discoveries in all areas of science and engineering, research and education. And we look at cyber infrastructure broadly. It definitely has the pieces such as a large computing systems, the networking systems, but also has the data infrastructure, the software system, cloud services, instrumentation, pilots, gateways, support services. And I think the most important piece of it is the people that really make this all happen. Um, we have been uh, working on really making sure we have a very diverse cyber infrastructure ecosystem to many decades of investments. Uh, it really brings together a very diverse set of capabilities, capacities that are then knitted together so that they are really accessible in a, to a broad community, right? That's our goal, right? So it includes very large scale systems, what we call the leadership class computing system. These are systems at the scale that uh, allow applications to run that and do science that would not be possible otherwise. Our current leadership class system is called Frontera. Uh, it's led by the Texas Advanced Computing Center uh, and MSCC is a partner with, uh, with TAC on that project, right? But it's also TAC is looking at the next step of that or next phase of that leadership class system, which is going, going to be a larger system, a more powerful system, at least 10 times more powerful than the current uh, Frontera system. It's also going to be a distributed system that brings different pieces together. We also have other uh, capacity systems that support computing to a broad set of users. For example, uh, we have Bridges and Stampede and Jetstream and uh, Anvil uh, and, and Expanse, right? These are a whole bunch of systems distributed through the nation that provide these capabilities. We have experimental systems uh, such as uh, Neocortex and Voyager and the National Research Platform uh, and Okami, which bring more experimental capabilities to science. Uh, we have support services, we have test beds of different sorts. And then we have uh, the open science grid of PATH, which really creates a federation fabric that connects all of these pieces together with campus resources so that uh, you, can, uh, you can really start off on your campus and then burst out and use this national infrastructure, right? So it's a very powerful infrastructure that tries to bring together and meet the needs of a diverse set of communities. And, and the ultimate goal is really to enable science, right? And the reason we do it is because of these, uh, these uh, science applications or science impact we have. Let me walk through uh, some of these. Many of you must have seen this picture, uh, which is now about a year old, right? Uh, this is, uh, I'm talking about the picture on the top left of the screen. Uh, this is an imaging of the event horizon of the black hole, which is in our galaxy, right? Sagus is A star. This is uh, coming off the imaging that we did on the uh, on a black hole in the M87 galaxy a few years back. And this requires a tremendous amount of data gathering, data processing, computing, before you can come up with an image like this, right? Uh, but then this is a type of, of discoveries you're trying to enable through the cyber infrastructure. Uh, the picture to its right is, is a picture I took out of the New York Times. This is work by Romy Amaro, where she was trying to model what happens to the Delta virus, Delta, Delta coronavirus, uh, Delta COVID-2 virus, when it's part of these aspir uh, respiratory aerosols, right? So when you sneeze, what happens? How does it propagate, right? And so she needed to do very fine-grained simulations that used multiple systems, in not only NSS systems, but also commercial cloud systems and DOE systems, brought them to, uh, together and was able to model this behavior of, of, this, uh, of this virus and it was great to understand so that we could better prepare ourselves uh, when we had these different uh, surges uh, in, in, the, in the pandemic, right? So again, very impactful, very timely research that was only possible because of cyber infrastructure. And you have some more examples at the bottom. You have one where it's trying to do very large uh, scale simulations of supercell thunderstorms to understand local hydration behavior. 
right? So you can understand these flash frauds and even predict them sometimes. Uh, the middle one on the bottom row is trying to model uh, supply chains and using uh, biological analogs to this, right? Can I look at uh, food chains and use them to under understand supply chain? And most importantly, to be able to predict these black swan events, right? We had this huge uh, issue with our supply chain that we are still uh, suffering from during the pandemic, right? How do you predict such events? And can I use uh, analogs in the natural uh, environment to be able to predict these behaviors? And then the last one is something which has a different kind of impact. It started as a project uh, to look at, to do intrusion detection. Now it's, it is a company uh, with over a billion endpoints and it's part of many operating systems, right? This is a piece of software that was built out of and funded our OEC now that has global impact uh, to make sure that it's protected against intrusion, systems are protected against intrusions. Right? So there are some examples. I'll give you one more example, right? I talked about the black hole image, right? That came out in 20, uh, 2019 of the M87 black hole, the black hole event horizon. Well, just a few weeks or maybe a month back now, uh, some researchers said, this isn't good enough. They used artificial intelligence techniques, machine learning techniques to be able to improve the resolution of that because now there were more sophisticated tools, techniques accessible, uh, new computing capabilities. They were able to use that and to come up with an even more refined image of that black hole, right? So we are always improving, pushing the frontiers of science using cyber infrastructure. And that's why we, we invest in, in the cyber infrastructure is to really enable science, enable research, enable education, and really drive uh, the frontiers of scientific discovery and innovation. So given all these investments that I, uh, that I showed you, right, we, we're realizing that it's only as good as the science it enables, right? So how do we make sure that everybody across this country can actually benefit from these, can use this to advance science, right? So the focus is that, yes, we have this infrastructure, but we also have to make sure that we democratize this infrastructure, the access to the infrastructure, and we make sure that everybody can leverage this to advance science, right? There should be opportunities everywhere to leverage these resources in, in your science, in your education uh, environment, in, in, in your uh, research. I'm now going to point to a report that many of you in the room were a part of, I believe, right? This was a great report led by Alan Blitecki, where he tried to understand you know, what are these barriers? What prevents people from accessing these resources, right? And here's just a quick summary. It's, a, it's a, just a great read, uh, but this is uh, as a, a few of the highlights. Uh, and it really comes down to lowering the barriers to access. And these include uh, knowledge barriers. What are the right resources to them? How do I find out where they are? How do I use them, right? What, what do I need to get my application running on them? How do I get an allocation, right? There are technical barriers. Do I have the connectivity to connect to that? Do I have the uh, required security systems operational uh, so that I can securely and meet the requirements of connecting to these systems? Um, right? Do I have the right local environment that allows me to access them? Right? So the technical, and then there are uh, some uh, social cultural barriers about the value proposition and, and the incentives for people to discover and use them. Right? And this report really highlights many of these barriers. And we've been looking at and taking it very seriously and we're thinking, how do we address these? Uh, and a, a lot of the focus in the office right now is really on trying to democratize science and try to uh, one by one address these barriers and make sure that this ecosystem that we have created is really accessible to everybody. And I'll just highlight uh, a few, and these really reflect a lot of the things that I, I saw in the slides that Joel uh, shared with me as part of his st stakeholder study, right? Access, this is a huge issue, right? Right now, there are, you know, the access is really through a mechanism that while it works well for some users, broadly, it's very hard. It can be intimidating where you have to write a proposal. You have to then get it uh, reviewed. And 
if you get a allocation, then you get onboarded, right? It's a six month process. Most researchers, when they're coming in, they don't know what I need. What's the right resource? What am I applying for? How much do I need? So it becomes very hard for them to write one of these proposals. So we think, how do we uh, uh, better leverage some things that all these resources have, uh, startup allocations, right? Which are very low barrier to access where quick turnaround, but going a, a step further, can we try to use the model that has been made popular by the cloud services, right? Where you can have some notion of a credit, whether it's a credit card or some other notion of credits, you can take it to the cloud wire and then immediately get access to it. Can I uh, use similar models for the NSF resources where you can go to NSF as part of your proposal or some other mechanism, get some credits, immediately take them to your resources and get access to them right away. Can we take it a step further and build gateways, which really provide very high level windows into these resources? Can we connect these resources seamlessly to your local computing in your labs at the institution, right? So that it's really very seamless to go to these resources and you don't have to do anything extra. You just burst out to it directly, right? So we are exploring ways to reduce this, uh, these barriers to access. A big piece that we're also addressing is data, and I'll come back to it in the uh, in in a, in a few slides, right? But the idea here is that data is such a big part of discovery. How do we reduce the barriers to both sharing your data that your research produces, but also benefiting from the data that's shared to the community that's coming out of the large instruments and the large observatories, uh, experimental facilities as they create more data? How do you lower the barriers to access that? And I think the most important thing that came out of the report is having expertise, right? Access to CI professionals, to experts that can help users onboard uh, to these resources, make the right selection, get the applications running. And one thing we realized that beyond having a central pool of resources, it's very important to have these individuals embedded where the science scientists, where the researchers, where the students are. So they understand the local needs, they understand the, the have the local connections and can work with the researchers. We've been uh, installing programs such as Skype, which is really to create such a network of experts, which is really the key to really democratizing uh, the science and the cyber infrastructure, right? Um, so, I, I can, I'll be happy to talk more about each of these issues. I just wanted to give you a, a, a highlight. I wanted to now just switch a little bit and talk about two things that are currently top of mind for NSF and across the agencies, um, because they really build on this vision that I laid out in the earlier slides about this democratized ecosystem, right? Uh, but they're targeting specific things, right? So there is a, a broader national effort of to do what we're doing in NSF, to do it across all the agencies at the national level, right? And, and so these efforts as, as shown in the, uh, on the image on the left of the slide, really look at this from different perspectives. Uh, I talked about the, uh, what NSF is doing in terms of access and data and people, how can we do that beyond NSF as part of a broader national ecosystem so that we don't have siloed resources across different agencies, we try to look at it as a national resource. Similarly, uh, how do we do this uh, as part of our, 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 our supporting open science? How do we do this towards enabling artificial intelligence research, right? This is a national AI research resource. And then how do we make sure that these are, uh, given that it's so important to have computing and data to address uh, any national crisis, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a pandemic, how do you create a national reserve that can provide the computing capabilities that would be needed? Uh, and when I say computing, I mean uh, the computing, the data, the networking, the software, the expertise. How do you make all of them accessible when we have a national emergency? So it can be mobilized very, very quickly. Right? So the number of efforts happening at the national level that build on this vision and try to bring these things together. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about the National AI Research Resource because that's something that's really getting a lot of attention right now. 
And the second one is a memo that came out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy focusing on open science and public access. And that's really talking about free, immediate, equitable access to research results from federally funded research, right? So let me dig in a little more on those two topics. So just to give you some background uh, about uh, in the National AI Initiative Act of 2020, uh, Congress, uh, there was legislation to set up a uh, national AI research resource, uh, which really was a system that could provide researchers access to the computing resources, to the data, to the research environment and educational tools to make sure that everybody can benefit from and contribute to AI research. Uh, as part of this, a task force was created uh, in June of 2021, and its goal was to look at the feasibility and create a roadmap for creating for building such a national resource. I co-chaired that task force. It, the task force uh, was operational till it created, it, it submitted its final report in January of this year, and then was uh, uh, ended in, in April, just a month back, right? But during this time, it, it created this vision. And in the next two slides or three slides, I'm gonna to try to summarize what this vision is, right? Um, so as I said, there were two reports that came out of this task force. Uh, the first one was an uh, interim report, which really came out in May and talked about what the broader vision is. But then the final report, which really came, came out in January of this year, went into a lot of detail on how do you build, how do you implement this? What is the roadmap? What are the budgets? What is the uh, architecture of this resource? So it provided a lot of detail and really uh, presented to Congress and the president a plan, a detailed roadmap of how one would set up such, such a resource. And since then, there's a lot of conversation going on how do you make uh, this a reality. And in terms of the vision, it really looked at it as a widely ac accessible national cyber infrastructure that can advance US R&D research uh, uh, and uh, innovation and discovery by powering users with access to different elements of cyber infrastructure, including high performance computing, cloud computing, uh, different uh, edge computing capabilities, high quality data sets, test beds, education material, uh, training and tools, user support mechanism. And the reason for doing this is, is really clear. Right now, AI is clearly, uh, a really transformative technology that's impacting every aspect of our lives, right? And it's evolving so quickly. Many of you are familiar with the, uh, with the way uh, tools such as chat GPT are evolving quickly, right? And that's just one aspect of it. So it clearly has this potential to impact every aspect of, life, of our lives. However, right, it's unfortunate that a technology that's so important, the ability to contribute to that is limited to only the largest technology companies that can afford the resources needed or very large and highly resourced institutions, right? So there's a huge digital divide between those who have the resources to contribute to this. And so the goal behind or the vision behind the NAIR is to how do we democratize so that everybody has the opportunity to contribute to AI R&D? How do we build a national capability that can provide the computing and data resources so everybody has an opportunity to contribute to AI, right? And that has a lot of impact. It gets everybody engaged. It also helps address things like bias, right? Because the more diversity we have in the researchers that are contributing to the models, to the data sets that are being contributed, right? The, the better we can address things like bias and fairness and, and, and issues like that. So there are many reasons to really stand up such a, such a resource. Um, in terms of build out, the, uh, the, the um, uh, task force uh, really laid out a very aggressive but thoughtful plan on how you could set up uh, as, par, as a phase process, right? The idea is that once this uh, project is launched, 
How do we make sure that we create such a resource that brings in all these different kinds of capabilities and then are accessible? And understanding that this is going to take some time, the task force also said, let's leverage the resources that already exist, such as the ones I showed you on that map for NSF. How do we leverage them to create a pilot there that can be operational right away? And the, the agencies are already thinking hard on, hard on how do we move ahead and create such a, uh, uh, such a uh, resource, right? So again, there was a URL on the previous slide and I'll share these slides that you can get more information, but I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, what, what are the opportunities? What, what do you see as the requirements that such an air uh, would, would like, to, would have to uh, address to make sure it does meet its goal of democratizing AI R&D, right? A big part of the report is spent on addressing issues related to privacy, civil rights, civil liberties, to make sure that the research conducted, that the resources, the data sets are really, um, you have the guardrails, you have the processes uh, that, that really make sure that these considerations are, are, are addressed, right? And, and the same thing for the research result that's coming in. How do you have the right uh, uh, oversight mechanisms, the right transparency, the right uh, monitoring mechanisms to make sure that we are doing uh, AI research in a way that it preserves civil rights, preserves civil liberties, preserves, preserves privacy, right? So that's really built into the uh, plan and the roadmap that's, uh, that's outlined in the report. I'm gonna to switch to the, the one more topic and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, and this goes back to something that happened in August of uh, last year, 2022, when OSTP uh, released a memo that said that they would like to make sure that there is free, equitable, and immediate access to federally results from federally funded research, right? Uh, previously, there used to be an embargo period, uh, right? And, and, and it was limited in a way, right? So that this memo said that we'd like to make sure across all agencies Right. There is the zero embargo that publications along with the data associated publications is accessible freely, immediately and equitably. And the equity aspect was emphasized and was along two dimensions. Equity in the sense that everybody has the infrastructure, the resources needed to comply with this requirement, but also equity to make sure that everybody can benefit from the results that are being shared. And so the, this was a, a, a really, a very important move, right? But also it really got all the agencies thinking about how do we make this happen, right? And it's created a lot of thinking. Uh, the requirement was that uh, agencies would roll this out by uh, 2025. And so there's a lot of planning going on right now, right? And there are, different dimensions to this, uh, to this new guidance, right? I talked about how do you uh, do this across the agency in a consistent way. So OSTP, there's a subcommittee on, on open science that has been leading this effort, having a conversation, right? So that we can do this, not in a siloed way, not in an ad hoc way, but in a thoughtful way that is consistent to the extent possible across all the agencies. Um, the big thing is removing the 12 month embargo. As I mentioned so far, it's been a 12 month embargo before these results were accessible. So how do you remove that embargo? How do you make sure that uh, the accessibility is immediate? And, that, and how do you do it in a way that you take into consideration the, what the uh, impact on the community is going to be, on the societies, on the different uh, publishers? So how do you have that conversation and do this in a thoughtful way? Uh, how do we provide guidance on sharing of data along with the publication, right? And that's a big part of it. How do you make sure that the data is shared, the data is usable, is, is equitably accessible, uh, and, and is able to, and that addresses many things such as reproducibility uh, and, and replicability of results and many other uh, dimensions. Uh, as I mentioned, equity is extremely important. And then finally, 
uh, supporting research and scientific integrity, right? That's the other big dimension. Again, that comes to this open sh sharing of data, of results uh, uh, that come out of federally funded research. All right, so again, there's a lot of discussion going across the agencies. NSF, for one, has been holding these uh, listen and learn sessions. We had one on Friday where we're reaching out to the community and trying to understand right, uh, what the impact of this policy is going to be. What are the barriers? Right? What are the concerns that the community has? How can we make sure it's most effective? How can we make sure that everybody is able to benefit from, from this, uh, this policy? Um, all the agencies were required to submit a plan and we did, we just uh, are in now having gotten feedback from OSTP, we are finalizing our plan and we intend to share it publicly. NIH did the same thing with their plan and we'd like to open it up and get your feedback on this, right? Does this plan make sense? Do you see barriers that it creates for you? Do you see concerns it's creating for you or your institutions? We'd love to hear that, right? Because it's we're hoping this is a, a dialogue and an iterative process because this, if it's done right, can be hugely beneficial. But if it's not done carefully, can really just further perpetuate uh, the divides that we have, right? So we have to be very careful and we'd love to get your feedback and thought on that. Uh, oh yeah, this, uh, uh, I, I talked about interagency coordination. So just a few, um, in, in the, um, and I'll put a URL at the end, but we, in our listen and learn sessions, we go through a lot of these question and answers. I just picked out two slides from this uh, that I thought would be most relevant here. Uh, the longer presentation has a sequence of these, right? So uh, here are some questions we have heard from the, when we have talked to the community uh, over the past uh, six, eight months, right? Um, NSF policy requires, uh, would require PIs to pursue open access research, right? So um, again, just to clarify, uh, the OSTP guidance is uh, an NSF policy applied to public access, not open access, right? So public access says that there's free access. It doesn't mean that uh, they have freedom to use your research any way they want, right? That would be open, right? So there's a slight distinction to the URL that uh, tries to highlight this distinction, but we are talking about making research results accessible free of cost to read. Right, and that's an important part of this. Sensitive data will be made available and therefore open to misuse, no. NSF is com uh, committed to responsible public access implementation. And really the, the mantra is as open as possible and as uh, closed as necessary, right? So there's uh, national security information, there's protected information that, that cannot be, right? So there is, uh, there is further guidance in our plan that talks about you know, what the framework for this is, but you know, just to uh, put it very simply, again, open as possible, but closed as necessary. Um, NSF policy will require PIs to pay gold open access or uh, uh, author publishing costs, right? And no, it doesn't really, the policy doesn't say you will have to go with one publication model. And part of a conversation is to figure out what is that right model? Is it gold open? Is it green open? If it's green open, how do we provide the infrastructure to support green open? Uh, if we provide access to AAMs, which are author uh, accepted manuscripts, right? This is the version of your manuscript that's accepted by the peer review process, but not typeset by the uh, publishers, right? So if you are, how do you make sure that, uh, that, that if you're using that, that is really uh, shared openly and it doesn't provide any inconsistencies or inequities by uh, supporting that. So we're having those conversations and we really want, again, this to be a conversation so you can see how you can benefit from that. Um, again, in terms of sharing data without an embargo could lead to sc uh, scooping of results, right? Again, it's we are committed to responsible public access implementation and I'll repeat, as open as possible, but as closed as necessary, right? Um, as I mentioned, there's a, a lot of information. Uh, here's a, a QR code that takes you to the public access website. 
but also we have a email address here and we'd love to hear from you again, uh, especially once we release the, uh, our NSF plan, initial plan, we'd love to get your feedback because I think it's really important that this is a dialogue, that we are you know, understanding what the implications of anything we do are and how do we make sure we take into consideration the diversity of needs, user communities out there so that we're not disadvantaging a community by uh, our implementation of this guidance that came out. I'm gonna stop here and open it up for questions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And let me stop sharing so I can get a better view of the room. Thank you, Manish. Thank you. So we have uh, Mike going. So here we go. Please uh, let Manish know who you are in case uh, he can. Hello, Manish. Tim Bottom here. Uh, the NARA is fascinating. I, I, I understand it's uh, cross-agency or interagency task force, but do you, is the vision to build a, a NARA or will agencies take it in different directions? Just curious so, about that. That's, that's a great question. The, the vision that's laid out is for a NARA, right? And, and they've gone into a lot of detail of how you'd achieve that. So there's, and I'll go into some, and go give you a few uh, aspects of that. In terms of governance, right, it's using a model that I know you're very familiar with, the cooperative stewardship model, right, where you have uh, a multi-agency steering committee, right, that then works with a non-governmental external operating entity, right, which is, uh, which is granted, uh, you know, example of that would be something like Exceed or now Access or something like that, which would then federate resources across agencies and commercial cloud providers and make them accessible as a NAIR. So it's truly a single NAIR with different agencies uh, participating, both in funding and helping oversee it. Uh, Dale Smith from the University of Oregon, uh, where you've um, have funded uh, us through the IRNC program for many years. Uh, as well as the American Indian Higher Education, where I'm currently working. Um, as we, as as I've engaged the tribal communities about using advanced technologies, particularly AI, and I think uh, there are some really interesting opportunities using natural language processing capabilities of of, of new platforms to uh, curate and preserve. Uh, tribal languages uh, in particular. Um, the big challenge there comes uh, up with sovereignty of data. Currently, you know, those tools for natural language processing are not open source. Yes, we can get access to them in the cloud. However, that means that the sovereignty, the ownership of that data uh, is gone. And um, I also see the sovereignty of data potentially showing up in the open access journal issue. So I'm wondering what thoughts have you given to concerns of indigenous communities about yet again, having things uh, taken from them without their position, uh, permission? Right, I think both really important point. The task force did spend a lot of time thinking about this and the report addresses this, right? We have to take these considerations on what data is shared, how it is shared, when it is shared, and having making sure that the infrastructure that's set up uh, uh, has safeguards, right? So that we are not uh, having uh, unauthorized access to the data and data set sovereignty is, is maintained. The same thing with the open access, right? If you look at our document when it comes out, or you look at what NIH has put out, that really very explicitly says that this, you know, there are data that you don't have to share because it, it's related to the issues that you just mentioned, right? And then, so this is something that is being discussed a lot. In fact, uh, currently in the SOS, this is exactly the topic that's being discussed. And, and how do we make sure we have these conversations 
And so there will be communication coming out that's going to uh, try to then initiate some of those conversations across the interagency. Uh, Alan Anderson, Salish Kootenai College. Uh, kind of continuing this question, I was just curious, did you guys, was there any opportunity to discuss like the open source community involvement? Because with the escape of the llama model, I mean, you got like three person teams out there and they're moving faster than just about everyone else. And I don't know at what level that it get, gets addressed. Um, I mean, they could easily use what what Dale was just talking about, and it just goes around every regulatory thing out there. So, do you have any information on that? Right. I mean, I think to the extent possible, putting uh, some guardrails around who accesses the resource, what data is part of this resource, what is the provenance of the data, uh, having those things uh, like to be able to manage this to the extent possible. Is really something that talked to thought a lot in the in the report, and we have talked a lot about having these guidelines adhering to many of the federal guidelines around these issues that have that have come out from NIST, right? The responsible AI, the AI Bill of Rights, making sure those are there. Uh, but also, then all trying to create uh, an within that framework, trying to create an open marketplace where you can share these things so that open source we can benefit from things that are already in the open source and bring them in there and then be able to build on that, right? So the, the and again, uh, the results from the data that is being, or the research that's being supported by there, how does that come back into uh, the community, right? So those are all the things that we gave a lot of thought to. I think a lot of the devil is in the details. So when we start implementing it, I think these will become immediate and, and we'll be looking to the community for inputs to make sure and, and have that process. So I think big part of it is having these oversight and advisory committees that are part of the process, right? So that these issues are reflected as we roll it out, right? Again, the plan exists, but it really comes down to now, how do we actually get the boots on the ground that are actually gonna stand this up, right? And I think making sure that they address these things is gonna be very important. Hey, Manish, this is Brian Bockelman from the Mortgage Institute for Research. Uh, I, I think the, the point about open access being potentially a, a equity issue and that it uh, requires resources to, to share data, especially large, large data sets. Um, can, can you highlight some resources and opportunities there might be out there uh, to help address this? I mean, for example, uh, CC Star Storage you know, pops immediately to, to mind. Right. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, it, it's being able to both sh share data so that uh, ha not having access to infrastructure shouldn't uh, disadvantage you in terms of getting your proposals funded, right? That's, that's a huge. How do you have local or national infrastructure that you can leverage to meet these mandates? And then on the other side of it, how do I make sure I have access to the data uh, that's out there from these large research projects and I can benefit from them and use them in my research. Um, See, so you mentioned CC Star, so that's funding storage at the campus level uh, to help address some of these needs. I, it does require the campus to commit to a few things, uh, such as uh, being able to sustain them, such as agreeing to be uh, to some uh, best practices on metadata and other aspects, but more importantly, being part of a national federation, for example, uh, Brian, uh, something uh, that, uh, that's close to you is the Open Science Data Federation, right? Or, but other ones like uh, the Open Storage Network. So being able to connect your data as part of this national network so that you're able to access other data sets, you're able to access compute resources, right? But you're also able to share your data as part of this network. And so we are trying to build out this framework so that we are, we are at least providing the scaffolding needed so that institutions are able to help leverage that and, and, and support these kind of uh, requirements that are coming out. The other thing is making sure that the national repositories and, and data sets are connected in there so they become more equitably accessible to the community. My name is Lee Slater. I'm from Salish Community College. 
Um, I have more of just kind of a general question on what you think the future impact of AI is going to be and how it could possibly relate to the mission and the goal of MCS, uh, SCC, I'm sorry, <laughs> MCCC. It's been a long day. Um, so overall, I'm kind of wondering if what's going to happen in the future is we're just going to have this ecosystem of people that are very uh, that have knowledge of a niche, and then they're going to be able to take AI tools and apply them into this other niche and then be able to work. And you'll have this kind of big ecosystem of people uh, working simultaneously in all these different uh, areas, and they'll have they'll be using AI basically as kind of their partner in essence. So uh, overall, what do you think the effect of AI is going to be on like the everyday scientist or the everyday you know infrastructure person? Um so I think the technology is, is evolving uh, very quickly and we are just scratching the surface of where it can be used, how it can be used, what, what can we do with it. Every day we are seeing new capabilities. We've seen this huge jump you've seen from GPT-3 to now GPT-4 and now you have BARD coming out and you have DALI and you have all these systems and Every day you're seeing a new use, right? I mean, I heard a term which I hadn't heard before called promptography, which is a new way of uh, developing art, right? And it's, it's a recognized term where you give the prompts and you generate art, right? So they, uh, it was on, on the radio the other day where they, there was an image that got a prize uh, and uh, in a photo photography contest, it was actually generated by Dali. Right? And then that sort of triggered a debate about what this was. So it's really changing how we do stuff, right? And, and it's just gonna keep growing as we learn about it and we learn about the pitfalls and the negative aspect. So the best we can do is to try to level the playing field where it's not just a handful of companies that can do this innovation. But right now it's very limited on who can do this because it depends on computing and data, right? And that has, it not only, it prevents, so we are not leveraging the talent that's around, uh, around the nation, but we also limiting the data that's fed into these models, right? And that's leading to models that are biased, that, that are unfair, right? So I think having this closed ecosystem has many negative impacts. Right? We, we are not being able to fully explore the uses of it. Uh, and we're coming up with models that are, that are really uh, not, not where they should be, right? And so how do we open it up? And that's really what the NAIR and, and, and a lot of these other things like the uh, uh, National AI, uh, uh, sorry, what's it? Uh, the NIAC, I forget what the acronym stands for, and, and, and folks at OSTP and other thinking hard about how do we make sure that we can open this up and really allow this innovation to happen in a more open way? And that the NAIR that I described is one part of it. It's ability for everybody to contribute to AI, but also explore new ways of using AI that are more relevant to, uh, you know, to society, to uh, uh, applications, uh, right, in, in, in an open way, right? So that, I think that's sort of where a lot of these things are, are heading. Uh, is to try to open up and and be able to leverage this innovation that's moving so quickly in a way that benefits everybody. Well, I'm going to take the mic because I have it in my hands and say, because you mentioned uh, leveraging talent and also talking to the, the teachers and the faculty members, we have a group of students here who just went through a hackathon and they're interested, I think, to hear what you think of their possibilities. What would you say to them? as inspiring words for their, as their journey and begins in this, this technology world. I think what we do with AI is really in your hands, right? I mean, it's, it's what you, what, that's where the real innovation is gonna be, right? We, we are, you know, the new ways you can use AI in a, in a fair, in an equitable way to improve life, to improve society, to address grand challenges, climate change, um, how do we do that? It's really in your hands, right? And this is a great tool, but that's just what it is. It's a tool, right? It's your innovation that's going to make it have the impact, its potential of 
uh, that's capable of having, right? So I think uh, the sooner you embrace it and, and the more you play with it and, and, and use it and innovate with it, I think that's, that's really where the future is. So, you know, just uh, get, get started with it. That's all I can say, right? Uh, yeah, leverage these opportunities such as MSCC and others and, and, and start uh, learning about it and seeing how you can leverage it and how you can contribute and improve it. All right. Well, please join me in a round of applause. Thank you, Manish. Wow. Thank you very much. And Manish, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you also to Kevin Thompson, who's here in spirit. Appreciate uh, that you were able to uh, come via video. Thank you so much. It's much appreciated. Thanks all. Bye. Bye-bye. You want to all right, uh, it's been a long, beautiful day, right? Okay, so uh, we're going to wrap up very soon. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Wiggins to uh, just say a few things as we get very close to the end. Okay. First thing I'd like to say is thank you. Thank you for everyone who came Thank you for everyone who stayed. And I'm going to be a little bit hopeful. And thank you for the things that we're about to do tomorrow. I understand that we all came here for one purpose, some various ways to get there, but the reality is we're here to try and improve things. And with that being said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I do have a subtle request. I'd like to commemorate, well, two things. One, I wanna say thank you to the staff that prepared this, all of the individuals with the MSCC board and all of the members that allowed this to happen. Thank you. And secondly, yeah, I'm gonna ask a request. I like to we'd like to commemorate this moment. So we are asking that everyone, students included, come to the front so we can take a photo. That's it. After that, please be dismissed.